mercy and peace to each of you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Look we'll at y'all out there starting off the year in the right way, attending worship and all that good stuff. It's great to see everybody today. If you're visiting with us, we want to extend a special welcome to you. Thanks for being here. We'd love to tell you more about our church. If you want to fill out the little card on the end of the pew and let us know who you are, we'd be happy to reach out and tell you some more couple of announcements as we get started today. Next week, we will ordain and install our new class of elders, and we will also celebrate the Lord's Supper next Sunday with our new elders leading us. That's the reason we're not having communion today, which is the first Sunday. So we'll do it next week. Session is a reminder of our meeting next Sunday following worship. And again, if you've been visiting for a while and it's time for you to join, that's the time when we bring in new members. We'd love for you to meet with the session for a few minutes and just be received into membership. <coughs> Other announcements we need to make on this first day of the year. Anybody? Nope. How many people stayed up till midnight last night? Okay, there's a few. Eastern Standard Time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's more than I expected from the survey I was taking earlier today, so that's good. I want to say a special thank you to Connie for helping us continue to celebrate Christmas. You know, today is the eighth day of Christmas, and we're going to continue to sell to do some carols today. I'm sure that the Campbell family was very appreciative of the eight maids of milking that showed up this morning. With all that. I'll be here all week. Prayer concerns, continue to keep Ruth Cantrell in your prayers, and Brenda and Ruby Heatley. Angela Lackey, keep Ricky in your prayers. I also add Anna Johnson to your prayer list today. Anna had a fall on some ice, ice skating and is recovering with a few staples in the back of her head. She's a, she's a soul. We'll, we'll pray she's for her. She said her pride was hurt more back than that. I'm sure. <laughs> Others we need to add to our prayer list today? Yes. Our, we got a call a little this morning that our son is in public tristar, uh, apparently the pancreas virus. Okay. And we're going there as soon as we leave here. What's his name? Uh, John. John. We'll keep John in our prayers and y'all as you travel up there. Safe travels. Anybody else? Ready to worship? Let us worship Almighty God together. This is the first day of the new year. <coughs> this is the time God calls us to rise up. This is the world God needs us to love. This is the day that our God has made. Our opening hymn is number 38.
then join me in the prayer of confession as we confess our sins together and sure and certain hope that through Jesus Christ our sins are forgiven. Let us pray together. Ancient of days, from the first moment of creation until now, you have made all things new. We confess that we dwell on our past far too much, reliving memories and wishing we could do things differently. As we move forward in this new year, may we be inspired to let go of what holds us back, whether it's nostalgia or fear or our skepticism. May we embrace the wisdom of our ancestors and live with our past, not as a burden to carry, but as a treasure that continues to reveal new lessons and understandings. May we deepen our relationships with one another and with you, working to live into your reign on earth as it is in heaven. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And may God of mercy who forgives us all our sins, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. generation, and it is on your branch. 
too. So your great grandparents, their hearts were filled so much by the love of Jesus Christ that they spread that love to their children and their children spread it to their children and on and on and on till we get to you guys sitting right here in this front row and that your hearts are filled by the love of Jesus Christ. And our job is to make sure that that love continues on. So our job is to make sure that we take the love in our hearts and we show it to other people around us. So as we enter into 2023, remember how I said our focus is looking at it? Kind of like looking at an empty page. I want your page to say that you are doing the work of God. You are sharing the love in your heart with everybody that you come across. You think we could do that for you this year? Well, I forget that. I think we all forget it from time to time, but that's okay because we know None of the people on our family tree were perfect. That includes us. We're not perfect. So there are going to be days that we forget. But we'll remind ourselves, and then we'll try to do better the next week. Okay? All right. Let's pull our hands, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the strong connection of love, the love that is passed down from one generation to the next. Help us to teach each other the very important lessons of love as we carry on to do your work in a new year. And all God's children say, Thank you, Shelby. Would you stand and sing with me our hymn of preparation, number 53?
We pray for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit, not just today as we read your scripture and reflect upon it, but in the new year, that you might continue to lead us, guide us, comfort us, and show us how we need to live. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Our responsive reading today comes from the prophet Isaiah, the 45th chapter. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. to do this song for you it's called never alone and when jesus was born all those years ago and he's still with you right in your heart you just open it and let him in
scripture lesson today, as we follow the narrative lectionary, comes from the first chapter of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. These are the first few verses of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen for God's word for you this day. An account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz. And Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of deportation to Babylon. <laughs> and after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Salathiel, and Salathiel, the father of Zer Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud. And Abiud, the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Akim, and Akim, the father of Eliud, and Eliud, the father of Mathan, and Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thanks be to God. So there was a man who had too much to drink and decided to walk home on New Year's Eve. A policeman stopped the man and asked where he was going. Oh, officer, I'm just on the way to a lecture, the man replied. The cop scoffed, come on, man, who gives a lecture on New Year's Eve? And without missing a beat, he said, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so today I'm doing a new thing, something I swore to myself that I would never do. I'm preaching a genealogy, and not as part of a larger reading or lesson, Today's lesson on this first day of 2023 is simply the long list of names specific to Jesus, known as the genealogy. Some of you were thinking as I was reading, boy, I'm sure glad I didn't volunteer to read the scripture today. <laughs> Not the names that we know like Tim or Mike or Susie. We have Jehoshaphat and Hezekiah and Zerubbabel, right? There are many examples of such in the Bible. Fun fact, there are 25 genealogies in Holy Scripture in both the New Testament and the Old Testament. In fact, I've been known to just tell people to skip over those. In trying to encourage people to read the Bible, when you get to that long list of names like we just read and people's eyes glaze over, I have said, just, just skip ahead. Know, know that the purpose of those names is to connect what happened in the past with what is happening now in the Bible, and just skip ahead in the interest of making things easier. Surely nobody would ever want to preach 
a long list of names like I just read. Wouldn't that be boring, right? <laughs> a pastor once announced that the church board would meet right after worship. After the close of the service, the church board gathered at the back of the auditorium for the announced meeting, but there was a stranger in their midst, a visitor who had never attended their church before. My friend said the pastor, didn't you understand that this was a meeting of the church board? Yes, said the visitor, and after today's sermon, I suppose I'm just about as bored as anybody else you came to. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like that. That's why I decided never to preach a genealogy. So why have I broken my own rules on this first day of 2023? Well, I noticed something in the first chapter of Matthew that I haven't really seen before. Something that I think is pretty fascinating. Something that I think informs our faith and the practice of Christianity for the new year. So let's try some new things out of some old things. Here's some things about this genealogy that you might not know right away. At the beginning of Matthew, our text in English says an account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. But in Greek, it actually says Biblios Genesos. Translated as the book of Genesis. It's meant to connect us to the very first book of the Old Testament. The book of Genesis in the Old Testament, and this is the book of Genesis for the New Testament. The connection. Then the writer of Matthew takes us backwards before bringing us forwards. An effective technique from Jesus to David to Abraham in historical reverse order. And then the writer starts with Abraham and brings the genealogical line forward in much more detail. Why start with Abraham? We know the names that come before that. Terah was the father of Abraham, and Nahor was the father of Terah. In fact, Abraham is actually the 21st generation out of the line from Adam. So why start with Abraham? The answer is simply the covenant that God made with Abraham. You will be blessed so that you might be a blessing for the world. Remember that? We are to understand that Jesus is a fulfillment of the covenant made with Father Abraham. And then the names really start to flow. And it's a fascinating list of characters. Right off the bat, we have the liar and the cheat Isaac, the one who stole his birthright from his brother Esau. We will see that again and again throughout the list. People who we would think would not deserve to be on a list of the founding fathers and mothers of our faith. In fact, that's another interesting fact. It's not just men. In the first century, the world was very male-dominated and patriarchal, and yet the writer of Matthew wants to be sure that we know the names of the women who participated in the genealogy of Jesus. Names like Tamar and Rahab and Ruth. There are five women listed in all. The line runs through David and then Solomon by the wife of Uriah. We know her name was Bathsheba, but for some reason the writer of Matthew describes her using her husband's name. You remember the one that David had killed so he could have her. There's no effort on the part of Matthew to clean this up at all. This is a cast of flawed human beings that God uses to bring his covenant into fulfillment. Not even David gets a puff piece here. The list of kings that follow David and Solomon comes next. Most of the names we don't really recognize. Students of the Bible would likely know that this is the time when Israel and Judah are conquered and carried off into exile. This is a dark time for God's people. The genealogy, however, continues through that entire period, all the way up to Judah, who was the father of Joseph, who with Mary, again another woman, was the father of Jesus, who was called the Messiah, as it says. What started as an arrow shot from the bow of Abraham has finally hit its target in the one who is called the Messiah. Matthew wants us to know that Jesus is the promised one, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, the one that all of creation has been waiting for for generations. Then the most interesting part for me, I discovered in verse 17, just in case you weren't counting on your fingers and toes all the numbers that are happening here, Matthew gives us a summary. 
There are 14 generations from Abraham to David, and then 14 generations from David to the Babylonian deportation, and 14 generations from that exile to the one called Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Well, that's kind of weird. Why would Matthew break it down like that? If you were a numerologist, then you would likely notice that everything is a derivation of seven. Seven is the perfect number biblically. It's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or three with human beings, north, south, east, and west, or four. The union of God and humans is seven. That's why it's the perfect number. So from Adam to Abraham is 21 generations, three times seven, and then three groups of 14, which are two times seven. One can get lost in all the numbers really quickly, and I don't think that's really the point. What I noticed when reading the list of names again is something else. It's why I changed my mind and found some gospel in these first 17 verses of names. Most scholars believe that the average life expectancy in the ancient world was 35 years old, give or take. In spite of what we read about ages in the Bible, most scholars believe that numbers in the hundreds were more about honoring the patriarchs with long life and not necessarily about their actual age. 35 was the average. So 35 times 14 generations is 490. Let's round it up to 500 years. Matthew might be trying to get us to notice that about every 500 years, something very significant happens for God and God's people. The covenant starts with Abraham. You will be blessed in order to be a blessing, as we said. Then 500 years later, we see the fulfillment of the United Kingdom, starting with David and continuing with Solomon. These are the glory days for God's people. Then 500 years later, we see a complete turnaround, the fortune of the exile, likely the bottom for God's people. Kind of makes your head spin, except that we realize that it's a 500-year span of time. The point seems to be that while very different things are happening for God's people, from the best of times to the worst of times, to quote Charles Dickens, God remains faithful always to the promise. The Messiah comes just as God promised, as fulfillment of blessings, and not just for God, but for all of creation. This genealogy demonstrates that in spite of history and characters that don't measure up and unfaithful people, God remains faithful. And that's good news for us. I remember years ago attending the Festival of Homiletics when it was hosted in Nashville years ago. Talk about a nerd festival. We heard the late Phyllis Tickle, author and Episcopalian pastor, tell the gathering of pastors to look around the room, she said. She postulated that the church is going through what she calls the regular 500-year rummage sale. About every 500 years or so, the church makes a massive shift. We might even see it as an extension of what we've already talked about. We've gone from Abraham 500 years to David, and then 500 years to exile, and then 500 years to the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. But we can continue from the resurrection of Christ to the fall of the Roman Empire is roughly 500 years. During this 500 year period, the church became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Then over the next 500 years, the church moved from being the religion of the empire to being an underground movement of monastic communities called the Dark Ages. Again, from the brightest days of Christianity under the Roman Empire to the worst of times. By 1054, the church had reemerged, but then split with the Great Schism, dividing the West under Rome from the East, from Constantinople. We get an entirely different looking church, Catholic versus Eastern Orthodox, a split that remains even today. The next great shift, of course, comes in 1519 with Martin Luther and the door of Wittenberg Chapel, ushering in the Protestant Reformation, with emphasis on learning and reading scripture and sharing priesthood of all believers. This is perhaps the 500-year period that we know the best because that's the one we continue to live in now. First Presbyterian Church of Spring Hill was formed and organized out of this way of being the church. 178 years ago, two-thirds 
of this 500 year period with all the meaning and purpose that we might expect from the Protestant Reformation. But recognize, if you can, that this is but one snapshot in the long history of God and God's people. Each set 14 generations, according to Matthew. Some of it is wonderful, some of it is tragic, but the good news is that God is faithful through it all. In fact, you likely realize by now, if you're following me, that if we're on track with the pattern, then it's time for yet another rummage sale, according to Phyllis Tickle. It's time to make the shift again, discarding what is no longer useful for a passage of another 500 years. At that festival of homiletics, Phyllis invited us to look around at the faces of those gathered in the room. She said, as pastors and church leaders, you are now making decisions that will affect the next 500 years of the church. So here's my question for you. As we end and start talking about 2023, are you excited about the new year and all that God has in store for us? Personally, I'm pretty excited about it, in part because of this long, boring list of names, the ones that I was not going to preach. It's a new year, and I'm doing new things. The genealogy of Jesus, who is called the Messiah, is a reason to celebrate. We're excited because God has shown us again and again, generation after generation, 14 generations after 500 years, that God remains faithful to us. No matter how we mess it up, no matter how faithless we are, God has a plan and continues to work that plan toward the end that God intends. What will the church look like in the next 500 years? Nobody knows. And that's kind of exciting, too. My friends, Happy New Year. Thank you for being the church called First Presbyterian Church of Spring Hill, alive and kicking in 2023. We will enjoy many blessings this year and maybe even some sad times, but God promised to never leave us or forsake us. The one who is called Messiah will be faithful still. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Let us pray together. Today I share a prayer with you written by Jill Duffield, pastor for our entire PCUSA denomination in this new year. Let us pray. God of our past, our present, and our future, as the calendar turns and we greet another year, we ask not so much for answers to those questions that perplex us, but for confidence in your never-failing care for us. As we reflect on the year we leave behind, we begin with gratitude for the moments and the milestones in which we experienced your presence. As we look to the year ahead, we start with hope for a kinder, more just, lavishly loving world. Through all the years, we depend on the abundance of your grace, the generosity of your mercy, and the unwavering promise your compassion. Aid us, Almighty God, when we fail to be the people you create, the people you call us to be. Comfort us, God, when we face times of sadness, loss, and grief. Admonish us, Lord of all, when we neglect the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Guide us, Spirit of God, all the days of this new year and indeed every day of our lives, until that time when we see you face to face. Hear us as we pray these words. Hear us as we pray the words you taught us to pray, saying together, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We continue to worship this morning by leaning forward our tithes and our offerings. shepherds watched their flocks. <clears throat> Thank you. 
a blessed and peace-filled New Year's Day. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord always look upon you in favor and give you peace.